Segments from Life in the Arts can now be viewed on demand on YouTube.com. Just go to YouTube.com, add slash longtimers, and that will take you to our YouTube channel. Welcome to another edition of Life in the Arts Classic Light. Life in the Arts is a program that your entire family can participate in and enjoy. On today's show, a virtual field trip to San Francisco to view an exhibit of paintings by George O'Keefe, presented by curator Tim Bergard. Artist Melissa Pickford dresses as George O'Keefe and presents the lesson. Painting flowers big. Life in the arts is beginning to enrich your lives with art now. Well, Georgia O'Keeffe, of course, is a household name for many Americans, but not for all. Um, she did die now, you know, in the 1980s, and so for a lot of people, she's really more of a legend than an actual person. One of the reasons to have the exhibition was to actually refocus people's attention on the works of art themselves, rather than simply on her famous public persona and the mythology associated with her life. Georgia O'Keeffe is considered one of the great pioneering modernists in American art. That's a group of artists that at the early 20th century really developed a unique visual vocabulary, sometimes abstract, sometimes representational. Most of O'Keeffe's works show representational subjects such as flowers, bones, uh, the, her adobe ranch house in, in outside Santa Fe. And they developed a unique visual vocabulary that is one of the great contributions to the history of art in the 20th century. Georgia O'Keeffe painted the Lawrence Tree in 1929. This was the year that she first went to the Southwest and began to make annual trips to stay in Santa Fe. She found this tree on a ranch, and it's called the Lawrence Tree because the famous writer D.H. Lawrence used to sit under this tree. O'Keeffe lies down under the tree on the ground at night and looks up into the heavens above. And what's wonderful is that our ordinary experience of a tree as being rooted in the ground and silhouetted against a horizon line is now completely inverted. Now what we see is the branches and the trunk soaring towards the sky, and the branches themselves, I often feel, look very much like the roots of the tree, as if they've somehow been rooted in the heavens and the stars above, and the beautiful amorphous cloud of foliage has now become like the Milky Way or some kind of cosmic image. And it's a reminder for O'Keeffe that no matter if you take the most ordinary object in the world around us or in the landscape and look at it in your own unique way, you will come up with your own unique vision. And it reminds us that the whole world, every aspect of nature, is somehow deeply and intimately interconnected with the rest of the world. Petunias too from 1924 is one of Georgia O'Keeffe's famous flower paintings, perhaps the subject for which she's best known. But what I love about this painting is that she takes a very common flower, the petunia, focuses on two of them, one of them right up front on the picture plane, almost iconic and centralized, but the other looming over a horizon line, the sort of arcing curve that you see at the top of the painting. It's always reminded me of the experience when we first saw those photographs from outer space of one of the planets rising above the horizon line of the Earth. And of course, the interesting thing, people don't realize, although we associate Georgia O'Keeffe with nature, especially because of her flowers, many of these flower paintings were created while she was living on the 28th floor of the Shelton Hotel in New York City. And so it's interesting to have that little reality check on her work. We know she actually went out and bought flowers in flower stores, cut flowers, and used those as the subject for her work. So they weren't always out in nature. And in this case, that beautiful horizon line that creates a sort of cosmic effect could just as easily be the edge of a flower pot holding petunias. So she has this wonderful ability in focusing on, on her subjects to sort of both connect to the larger world, but also to do that while starting from a very uh, prosaic experience. 
The first person to show George O'Keefe's work in New York City is Alfred Stieglitz, who was already famous as a photographer in his own right. He's the photographer who first elevates photography to the realm of fine art, and that's one of his great contributions to American art. Another great contribution, though, was to discover O'Keefe, as it were, and to exhibit her work publicly for the first time in New York City. When he first meets her, his first attraction to her is actually through her work. He sees her work before he meets O'Keefe, but when she comes to the gallery and confronts him, because he's shown her work without her permission, he convinces her to let the work stay up, saying, when you give birth to a child like this, you have no right to refuse it from the world. Um, he goes on, however, to make photographic portraits of O'Keefe, and he makes nearly 300 portraits over the span of 30 years. Stieglitz once said his ideal photographic project would be to follow a child from birth through the end of their life and photograph every aspect of their life as they age. In a sense, he did that with Georgia O'Keeffe, although he meets her when she's 30 years old. And he photographs every aspect of her body. Some are recognizable, as in this photograph, as being O'Keeffe. We recognize her famous likeness, which Stieglitz has contributed to through these works, but also in other works he focuses on her hands or her neck or her legs or different aspects of her body. Taken together, the nearly 300 photographs form a composite portrait. And this aesthetic was very influential for O'Keefe, the idea of looking at an object or a person or a thing and looking at individual focused aspects of it in order to create a more true picture of the whole. Summer Days from 1936 is one of O'Keeffe's paintings of bones and skulls. She writes that when she left New York City in 1929 and started going out to New Mexico, that there were no flowers in the landscape because after all, most of it was desert and the flowers are only out for a short time every spring. But what she wrote was there were no flowers, but I picked up the bones that I saw in the desert. And this is very revealing because most people would associate bones and skulls with a traditional vanitas theme, a tradition of the mortality of all life Life, especially human life, but also animal life. Or they might even associate her bones and skulls with the uh, tradition of the settlement of the American West and bones and skulls as somehow being a symbol of failure and death and so forth in the desert. In fact, for her, the fact that she likens them to flowers and the fact that you see flowers in this painting is her sign that, in fact, she considers them to be alive. They've been cleansed, they've been bleached by the sun and the wind and the rain and the sand, and they've been purified into something beautiful and white and spiritual and clean. And then they've been elevated and sort of hovering above the horizon line, elevated up into the clouds, something that truly is hovering almost in a sort of uh, uh, ascension, like you think of it, a religious ascension of Christ into heaven, and something that therefore is given a timeless quality rather than one that's grounded in issues of mortality. So they become very iconic, very resonant images that are about beauty, about the interconnectedness of life and death in nature, and ultimately about something much larger than our mundane existence. In 1945, Giorgio O'Keefe buys an 18th century Spanish colonial rancho from the Archdiocese of Santa Fe and moves into it and begins renovating it. And it's wonderful because, of course, it's a direct connection to the Spanish history in the Southwest. And she's very aware of this. She writes that Spanish Catholicism and that history lies like a blanket across the New Mexico landscape. But she also writes that she buys the house specifically because of the door in the patio, this wonderful, weather-beaten, driftwoody, beautifully gray, weathered door, which for her, of course, is very beautiful in the way that the sun rakes across it and falls across it, the contrast between the wood graining, the raw wood graining, which has been opened by the weathering process, versus the beautiful soft texture of the adobe sand that's on the adjacent walls. And so she sees it immediately in artistic terms. She does not see it as a functional door to walk through. She sees it as a door to be appropriated and depicted visually as an artist. Very typical of O'Keeffe. She cannot look at anything in the world around her without seeing it in artistic terms. So she buys the house and creates a wonderful series of patio paintings. This work is called In the Patio one from 1946 and in it you see her abstracting the door into these geometric shapes while also acknowledging the walls of the adobe the way that sunlight filters through and on the one hand creating a very two-dimensional composition that seems to be all about design on the surface and geometric forms and on the other hand creating an interesting tension between two dimensions and three dimensions as it pulls into the picture plane and suggests some kind of recession into depth it's a wonderful way of taking the most simple means the economy of means that she derived from Asian art influence and saying the most with the least.
Georgia O'Keeffe loved painting flowers. She loved flowers in her life and really took time to look at them. She's perhaps most known for her huge flower paintings. What she did was use oil paint to create huge canvases, sometimes three by four feet, where she would blow up or enlarge a single flower so that it just became more of a beautiful arrangement of shape and color and line. It, she almost abstracted the flower so that sometimes her flower paintings um, don't look quite like a real uh, drawing or painting of a flower, but they become symbols sometimes, a permanent image of the essence of a flower without season or wilt or decay. Sometimes some people have said about her flower paintings that they're pure expressions of emotion. Let's look at some of her flower paintings here that I have in small postcards in front of me. They're just wonderful how soft and bright her colors are. So today, you're going to have an opportunity to draw a huge flower painting yourself. Instead of oil paint, we're going to use oil pastels and a little bit of turpentine um, rubbed on with a Q-tip at the end. That'll smooth out your oil pastel and make it look a lot more like real oil paint. And they're a lot of fun to use. Um, now what you can do is bring in real flowers into your house or your classroom and really just spend time looking at them for a while. Or you could actually get a book on George O'Keefe or some of her posters and copy uh, one of her flower paintings as best you can. <clears throat> but the most important thing you should know in this lesson is that your flower should fill the whole page. There should be very little background showing. You should make it just as big as you can. So <clears throat> what I do when I begin to draw a flower like this, I think what I would suggest to you is that you outline the flower first that you're going to be drawing all the major petal shapes. And you could just use a pencil or a very light color of oil pastel so you can see it. I couldn't use a pencil today on our camera because it won't show up. So I used a red, <coughs> kind of an orange red oil pastel just to get the basic shapes outlined of my flower. And I'm actually looking at one of Miss O'Keefe's paintings here of a giant red poppy. So after I draw the basic shapes and sort of plan out where my black areas are going to be and where my red areas are going to be and where the stem is, then I know that I can just spend time enjoying drawing with the oil pastel. And what's really fun, what's really appealing about oil pastels is how creamy and smeary they are. You can take your finger and smear them and it feels good. There's a lot of nice um, richness to the stick and you'll enjoy using them. They feel different than crayons. And do you notice how I'm using the side of the oil pastel and not just the end point of it? That helps you cover larger areas a little bit faster and the color goes on a little bit um, darker and heavier. So I'm really paying attention to the areas that are truly red and the areas that are more of an orange red. And I'll be doing a lot of blending after I get the main color down here. Okay, and when I'm doing this, White is really helpful too. It just lightens up the areas of red a little. And I found it was absolutely, I absolutely needed the white when I was doing this poppy painting. It made such a difference in keeping it lighter and giving it a little sense of, of glowing. So even the most ordinary little flower you could look at and make it huge on a page, make it so much bigger than it really is. And then it would seem larger than life. Let's 
it's actually starting to look like a flower. <laughs> and when you draw, just be gentle with yourself. Try to turn off those critical <clears throat> voices inside your mind that say, oh, I can't draw, and I'm not a very good artist, and not, my flowers will never look as good as Georgia O'Keeffe. I felt some of those things. But then as I'm drawing, I'm just enjoying it so much, I'm forgetting all of that. And just giving me myself permission to learn, which is what I encourage you to do. You're just learning to look and to make shapes and to see. I think one of the best ways to learn how to draw or paint is just to spend a lot of time looking at what you're going to paint. Georgia O'Keeffe used to get up very early at dawn and go walking, and that was a time when there were no people around. So she could really absorb her eyes in the landscape and the flowers and the plants near her. <clears throat> she just spent time really studying, really looking. Adding a little white again to lighten up my orange area. And layering over a little yellow too. going to spend a little time. I've got most of the color areas kind of blocked out. I'm just going to add a little more yellow here and there. It needs a little more of that color and blend some of my orange and yellow together up here. The yellow really helps separate the different petals and makes the darker, redder areas kind of stand out more distinctly. These little areas of white that are left by the strokes of my oil pastel stick will blend in and disappear when I actually use the turpentine to rub over. And just one note for teachers, um, in your lesson plan, your printed lesson plan that I sent out, it says to use linseed oil, but I found that the turpentine, or even a good turpentine substitute that's a little less toxic, works even better. So that's just a little correction that I'm making now, to use turpentine on a Q-tip to rub, not the linseed oil, which could be a little messy. And blurry. So now that I've got the basic um, shapes of the flower petals, what I'm going to do is add these little accents of black that ha come in some form of poppies. And then I think we'll really begin to see the flower come to life. Just a little bit here and there. You wanna, you want, black is such a strong color. It can really dominate what you draw. So just use it very carefully and very gingerly. Now I'm working on that black heart of the poppy. Now the black I notice will really cover over any color. That's why I did it last. If I had done the black first, it might have been hard to cover. It would have definitely been hard to cover the red or orange or yellow or white over it. And 
Now, in the center of this poppy, there's a little sort of grayish white center, and I'm going to draw a little bit, just le leaving space for that. So I know I'm going to work around that with my nice dark black. And someone asked Georgia O'Keefe once, why, why do you make your flowers so big? She said, well, so people will really look at them. If I made them small like they really are, no one might even notice them. I'm leaving space for that little grayish flower shape in the center. Okay. Coming, I'm now going to start working a little bit on that stem, the cup of the flower here. There's just a little black kind of smeared up to underneath the bowl of the flower. Just a little here, and it kind of outlines the stem area too. Going back and smoothing out my center shape here. Decided it looked a little rough. Okay. I need to s I'm using two colors of green. Because in nature, there's so many different greens. Um, and you can blend them. So they become the color that you really want. There's a little white in this stem too in, in Georgia O'Keeffe's painting, so I'm going to make sure to stay true to that and blend quite a bit with my finger here. I do want to take some time uh, to show you how I blend with the turpentine. I just pour it in a little cup and use the Q-tip. And just rub it on gently. It really, it really is fun. It really smears out that those scratchy marks, softens them, and you feel like you're working with paint for a moment. Now notice I'm staying away from the black right now. I'm not getting my Q-tip in the black just because that will make a big smear of black over my red petal areas. I'm going to save that till last and use a, a separate Q-tip that's just used in the black. You're just pushing the color around with your Q-tip. I'm noticing my Q-tip's getting a little raggedy, so I'm going to switch to a new one. And you can use as many as you need to just to keep a nice little end of cottony end working to move the color around. the black strokes that come up from underneath the flower. Now I'm going to use a Q-tip that already has been in black and just smooth out that center just a little bit.
in George O'Keeffe's paintings, she often had a clear blue sky. She lived in the sunny desert for so many years. Um, you know, you can leave your background white. I just thought with this poppy, a, a little blue might really help that red stand out. So I'm using two different colors of blue, a light and a dark, and, a, and the white, which really helps the sky become more open and airy looking. It helps blend the two, the dark and the blue, the dark and the light blue colors. The white is a great blending stick. Just a little hint of blue sky around the flower. I'm very lightly doing this, hardly rubbing into the surface of the paper at all. And sometimes you might get a little smear from your red, but that's okay. But when you add a little background color, it really helps to give your drawing a finished look. Using my Kleenex here to blend that sky a little bit. Then I'm going to use a, a clean Q-tip and kind of blend and rub those strokes in the sky that I did. Just a little more blue and white. Well, as I finish my background here, I just want to tell you it's been such a pleasure to draw flowers with you today. <clears throat> and I hope that you'll take time in your life to really stop and look at the flowers in your environment remembering how much Georgia O'Keeffe loved to paint them and be inspired by her life and her work. Thank you for your attention today, and I'm sure your flower paintings will be just beautiful. Next time on Life in the Arts, our favorite art teacher, Lori Myers, presents a lesson on pointillism in the style of George Seurat. Also, we'll go to the beach and hear from artist Jerrica Conley, creator of the Painted Dog event. And we'll see a performance of Bar Carole by the talented McDowell family. And finally, a Life in the Arts book club with special correspondent Elizabeth Reed. Don't miss it next time on Life in the Arts.